this point in time, we'd like to invite to the stage none other than the leader of the PNP, the opposition leader at this moment, <laughs> um, Jamaica, none other than Mr. Mark Holder. <laughs> Colleagues who are here with me on the tour. Lisa, who spoke so lovely, so well. Yeah. Dr. Dayton Campbell, General Secretary of the People's National Party. Dr. Angela Brownberg, first female chairperson yeah. of the People's yeah. National yeah. Party. Yeah. This is Keisha Anderson, our treasurer. And daily of Walker Huntington, co-chair of our International Diaspora Affairs Commission, and the brain behind this tour, and the coordinator of the efforts. Many people put in a lot of work to make this happen, but Dela was the one who was steering the ship for the bigger. Christopher Henry, leader in part of the leadership of the PNP Patriots, which is our young professional arm and junior spokesperson for foreign affairs and foreign trade. I just want to acknowledge the folk singers before, Brata, Brata, you man them nice. about Dog War in Matches Lane, all that around from my mind is, well, I try to remember a time when a dog fight in Matches Lane would have been something big. <laughs> and a dog fight is a problem in Matches Lane. <laughs> but that's how it goes, you know? Anyway, I am actually here to speak to you about the Caribbean diaspora's influence on the United States of America. And it's time that we speak on that theme because, as you know, Jamaica is celebrating 60 years of independence. But here we are 
in the US of A, and we are addressing members of the diaspora. And the influence of the Caribbean diaspora is significant. So I want to touch on that theme in this lecture tonight. I also want to recognize the members of faculty, staff, administrators of Medgar Evers College of the City University of New York, or as we would say in Jamaica, big up to the Cougars in the house. <laughs> it is indeed a distinct pleasure to participate in the Caribbean Research Center's speaker series. I must thank Dr. Ken Irish Bramble, who is the Executive Director of the Caribbean Research Center, for extending the invitation to contribute in this prestigious speaker series. I must admit, there is certainly a special excitement about engaging with you in New York City, in Brooklyn, no less, the birthplace of the great Jamaican notorious <laughs> B.I.G. himself. <laughs> we are in New York, where arguably the greatest concentration of Caribbean people residing outside of the Caribbean region live and work and have raised generations of proud Caribbean American children. Yes. To grasp this, one only has to recall the vibrant images of the annual Labor Day Parade, or on a more granular scale, one only has to go out into one of the myriads of small business establishments that have been built by Caribbean entrepreneurs over decades, ensuring that a piece of the Caribbean is always available here in the US of A. So whether it is a patty, whether it is rice and peas, sauce, jerk chicken, cornmeal porridge, even in the dead of winter here in New York, in New York one can feel the centrality, the importance and the impact of the Caribbean and Caribbean people on this place. The powerful vibe of our culture, of our way of life, is well represented here in all its glory in New York City. So to deliver this lecture this evening is a distinct honor and privilege. That said, and in spite of the references I've just made, I wish to begin with the strong assertion that the impact of the Caribbean on the United States of America is not limited to festivals and food. <laughs> Too often, these are the predominant and limited images of who we are and where and how we have contributed. Without adequate expression of the seriousness, the scope, and capacity of Caribbean people's social, political, cultural, and historic engagement in this country. And I must begin with the historical foundation of the Caribbean diaspora, which was actually during the 17th century, when enslaved Africans were brought from Barbados by slave owners to work in South Carolina. We must recall, and that's the first, as I understand, the first Caribbean people to come to the U.S. of America. We must recall that until 1776, much of the Caribbean, then the British West Indies, and what is now America, were all British colonies. Bound together not by sharing contiguous lands, but by law, by culture, the brutal realities of the transatlantic slave trade, and the courageous acts of resistance through which our enslaved foreparents in these lands fought to secure liberation. During the 18th century, the majority of enslaved persons in the northern states were transported from the Caribbean, outnumbering those brought directly from Africa. Up to 20% of enslaved persons in South Carolina were from the Caribbean. Along with South Carolina, Virginia, and New York, a large Caribbean community expanded in Boston. By 1860, just before the Civil War, it is estimated that one of five, one of five Bostonians were born in the Caribbean. 
So when we talk about the important role of Boston in the anti-slavery movement, we must account for the presence of black people from the Caribbean who played an important role in the struggle alongside US-born activists. And indeed, Boston became a hub of both the national and international anti-slavery movement and commemorated each year the anniversary of emancipation in the British West Indies on the 1st of, October, sorry, 1st of August, 1834, even while fighting for enslaved persons still laboring in bondage in the state south of the Mason-Dixon line. So the influence of the Caribbean in the United States goes way back and is very profound. And of course, we, so, we must acknowledge the tremendous significance of the War of Liberation and Independence waged by the enslaved people of Haiti <laughs> against France and its Western allies yes. from 1791, yes. led by the brilliant military strategist and freedom fighter Toussaint Louverture. <laughs> As a man from Jamaica, I have to acknowledge Dr. Bookman. And say it was the man who really kicked it off over in Haiti. The success of their struggle led to Haiti becoming the first black republic in the Western Hemisphere, established as a sovereign state in 1805, and the first nation in the world to constitutionally guarantee the freedom of all people, regardless of race. Haiti was the first of the The impact of this momentous achievement by Haiti on the freedoms eventually attained in the rest of the Caribbean and in the United States cannot be overstated. After the American Civil War, the foreign-born black population in the US grew from some 4,000 to over 20,000 persons. Around the turn of the 20th century, with many thousands moving from the Caribbean to the northern cities of the United States, joining with their African-American brothers and sisters who were fleeing the South during the Great Migration, they were not met with open arms. And in the bleak summer of 1919, anti-black violence surged in cities across the US against the influx of migrants, both from the South and from the Caribbean. So all of that struggle involved us in the United States as well. It's called the Red Summer because of the blood that flowed in the northern city streets. The great poet from Jamaica, Claude McKay, then living and writing here in New York, penned the iconic poem, if we must die in homage to the bloodshed taking place in that red summer of 1919. Many of you would be familiar with that inspirational poem. We recited it in school as little children in Jamaica. I know that many of you did so too, whether you went to school in Kingston or in Jamaica. Queens. <laughs> so my friends, the history of this country is deeply entwined with and cannot be extricated from the history of the people of the Caribbean. While the flow of immigrants from the Caribbean to the US was tightened in the mid-1920s, after the passage of the Immigration Act of 1924, the Ellis Island Museum displays the names of countless Caribbean nationals who sailed into New York Harbor and saw Lady Liberty welcoming them to America. Of course, the America they would encounter on arrival was not always the one that they had imagined. It was during that period that a man from the Caribbean, from Jamaica in fact, would migrate to the US in 1916, with the powerful intellect and steely determination to create what became the largest and most powerful transnational black organization in history, the Universal Negro Improvement Association and African Communities League, the UNIA ACL. That man was, of course, 
Marcus Mosiah Garvey, Jamaica's first national hero. In 1920, Garvey and the UNIA held a delegates conference in Harlem that was attended by more than 25,000 persons from across the world. We should never understate, and it is important that we, as the Rasta elders would say, seek to overstand the deep and abiding impact of Garvey, yes. the UNIA, and the social, political, cultural, and economic vision of Garveyism, not just on the Caribbean and African diaspora, but on the United States of America. Between 1941, during the World War II, as it's called, and 1950, some 50,000 Caribbean nationals migrated to the US. Several originally came here as farm workers, working on sugar and tobacco plantations in Florida and other states. But over time, they left the farms to relocate in cities like New York and Boston, as they found ways to change their status from farm workers to landed immigrants who could remain legally in this country. Having achieved this legal status, many of them brought their relatives from the Caribbean to join them in the diaspora under the American immigration concept of family reunification. Most of these immigrants from Jamaica and other Caribbean nations did not come to America only to benefit themselves. They were determined to integrate into the communities where they settled, like here in New York, and they were determined to make significant contributions to their newly adopted home. These early members of the Caribbean diaspora included people like Carlos Juan Finley from Cuba, who having determined that mosquitoes were the cause of yellow fever, helped to eradicate the disease in the US. A Cuban helped to eradicate the disease of yellow fever in the US. Many of the famous writers and artists during the 1920s Harlem Renaissance were either born in the Caribbean or of Caribbean descent, many of them. Some great examples include Nella Larson, who published several no novels, including Passing, which was recently adapted to a film some of you may have seen. She was of paternal Caribbean parentage. Her father was from what is now known as Suriname. Arthur Schomburg, after whom the famous Schomburg Library in Harlem is named, who migrated to this city from Puerto Rico. Cicely Tyson, the outstanding stage and screen actress, who was born in Harlem in 1933 as the daughter of immigrants from Nevis. Hazel Scott, the African-American classical and jazz pianist, who was an immigrant from Trinidad and Tobago, and was raised in New York City from the age of four, and later became the wife of legendary black US Congressman Adam Clayton Powell Jr. And of course, Malcolm Little, later known as Malcolm X, who was the son of a Grenadian mother and a father who was a self-declared Garvey. Malcolm himself, there you go. Malcolm himself expressed that he was influenced by Garvey's values of black pride and self-reliance taught to him by his father. The U.S. tightened its immigration laws again in the 1950s, introducing a rigid quota system. But in 1965, President Lyndon Johnson's administration passed a new immigration act, which liberalized immigration to the United States and resulted in a resurgence of Caribbean migration here. It is estimated that approximately one million Caribbean immigrants came to America between the 1970s and the early 1990s. Nearly half of them from Jamaica, and the vast majority settling in this tri-state area of New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut. While history may not highlight the achievements of many of these early migrants, they place significant emphasis on education. And most importantly, they ensured that their offspring, born and raised in the U.S., were imbued with strong values, positive self-belief, the spirit of innovation, and entrepreneurship. 
and a sense of civic responsibility and community engagement. Those early 20th century Caribbean migrants have thereby left an indelible imprint on this American society. And they are honored by their outstanding achievements of so many of their descendants. And among the notable figures from that second generation are Minister Louis Farrakhan, who was born in New York in 1933 to Sarah May Manning, an immigrant from St. Kitts, Nevis. Harry Belafonte, also born in New York City, right here, whose father was Harold George Belafonte Sr., a Jamaican chef. Wow. J. Bruce Llewellyn, a businessman who was chairman, CEO, and a part owner of the Coca-Cola Bottling Company, and also a founding member of the 100 Black Men of America. He was born in Harlem to a Jamaican mother and a Guyanese father. General Colin Powell, we say Colin, but a Colin, they call him. A former chairman of the U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff and U.S. Secretary of State, who was born in Harlem to Jamaican immigrants from the parish of St. Elizabeth. And of course, and of course, U.S. Congresswoman Sheridan Chisholm, a legendary colossus of American politics. She was born in Brooklyn to parents who are Guyanese and Barbadian immigrants. Shirley Chisholm served on the New York General Assembly prior to her election to the U.S. Congress in 1964. She holds a historic distinction of being the first black woman to serve in the U.S. Congress and also the first woman and the first black woman to run for the presidency of the United States of America. I know here with admiration that last year, here at Medgar Evers College, you hosted your ninth annual Shirley Chisholm Conference, focusing on women's empowerment. Big up, Medgar Evers. Friends, I want to pause for a minute and take us back a little to the beginning of this talk and then move us forward. I want to consider together for a moment this concept of diaspora. And I'm not focusing on the dictionary meaning of the word because that deeper thing than the mere meaning of the word in the dictionary. When you check a stock, as we say in Jamaica, it is like when we talk about where our neighbors drink cut. For Caribbean peoples, whether in the 18th century or in this 21st century, whether first generation, second, or beyond, no matter where we go, our neighbors are being cut in the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. And more specifically, in our countries, either of origin or birth or cultural claiming. And that is why you find that wherever we go, we carry literally our symbolic umbilical cord with us. And it's these cords that transcend time and space. It is these cords of deep connection that allow us to come together in community as a Caribbean diaspora. Mm -hmm. And I just want to echo what Lisa said about Brata, singing largely Jamaican folk music in Jamaican patois. But a Grenada, a Shrini, a Cuban, a Dominican, and you know, one Jamaican or two Jamaican. One say from Ghana, I think. Yeah, but it's all Jamaican to me. Is that true? Yeah. Yeah. So you see the melting pot and the synergy and the cultural claiming right here. So during the 1970s, the Caribbean diaspora in the U.S. grew exponentially with significant numbers of our people again pouring into the New York region and a new trend emerging of settlement down in South Florida. Like their predecessors that cemented a strong Caribbean diaspora in the early to mid 20th century, the migrants who came to the U.S. in the later years of the century were ambitious, determined to make a success of their life, and driven by positive ambition. They did not shy away from instilling their culture on the American society, creating a new Caribbean American culture that is so richly exemplified in music, 
dance forms, theater, cuisine, and overall achievement. Today, across America, the phenomenal beats of reggae and dancehall music are everywhere. The impact of artists like DJ Cool Herc on the birth and flourishing of hip hop here in New York cannot be overstated. Reggaeton is another genre that is directly influenced by music from Jamaica and the Caribbean. Soca from Trinidad and Tobago, Compass from Haiti have also had strong influence on the US culture. And then there are the name brand artists from the Caribbean, such as Sean Paul and Shaggy from Jamaica, Nicki Minaj from Trinidad, Rihanna from Barbados, who have dominated American and indeed global popular culture yes. in the last two decades. Mm -hmm. And before they emerged, Robert Nista Marley, <laughs> Bob Marley, had moved beyond being a musical legend, yeah. having transcended yeah. into a timeless icon of the struggle for social justice and resistance to oppression in whatever form and from whatever source. And after big up <coughs> Bob Marley, after big up all the whalers, coming out of Trenchtown and the MP. All right, he was born in St. Anne. But he learned the thing in a trench. <laughs> as strong as the influence of Jamaican music is in the US, this influence is rivaled by the influence of Jamaican food. Take the Jamaican party. In the 1970s and the 1980s, where the influence of Jamaicans to the US really peaked, it wasn't easy to find a Jamaican patty shop then. Today, the Jamaican patty is a popular and pervasive food item in the US, found in large supermarket chains. Several schools now serve our patties for lunch to students across America. You know, please do what I poem about Jamaica colonized England in reverse. Yeah. <laughs> I do it for to America too. And I could not stand before you here in New York and not pay tribute to and attribute significant contribution to the global reach of the Jamaican party to one of the most successful Jamaican businesses in New York, right. Golden Cross. That's right. yes. The operators of this fast growing US franchise have indeed helped to crown the Jamaican party here in Jamaica, and of course they've expanded beyond patches. And I, we had the pleasure of hanging out in Atlanta on this tour with, with Jackie um, Cawthon, one of the founders from the family that built Golden Trust. But in addition to the party, Americans are eating more varieties of Jamaican food than ever. In American restaurants, it has become common to see jerk this and jerk that on the menu. The ultimate Jamaican delicacy of oxtail and beans that was once regarded as low on the social, social ladder <laughs> is now in such high demand across the US that it is more expensive than steak and chicken. <laughs> and it even found its way onto many a Michelin star. <laughs> it is amusing to learn Americans who couldn't tolerate spicy food, now heartily consuming the popular Jamaican curry goat and curry chicken. Yes. And also a wide range of delicious rotis from Trinidad and Tobago and Guyana. Thanks to the influence of Jamaican and other Caribbean food in New York and other parts of the US, a vibrant market has developed in the US for Jamaican and other Caribbean produce, spices, juices, boosting local business communities and our exports from the region. So you are helping to develop our countries back home by changing tastes and developing tastes here in the US. Yeah. However, as I said earlier, as important and amazing as these things are, we are not only festival and food, bacchanal and bully beef, dance hall and don't <laughs> The influence of the wave of Caribbean Americans in the second half of the 20th century expanded significantly into the fields of business and politics. Thriving Caribbean business communities emerged New York, Florida, Georgia in particular. 
A successful Caribbean media industry also blossomed, mainly in New York and South Florida, where high concentrations of Caribbean Americans reside, and continues today primarily in the form of free-to-air and online broadcasting. So we're making our impact felt in broadcast media. As the numbers of Caribbean Im immigrants increased, and the first generation of Caribbean Americans came of age, more Caribbean Americans entered the American political arena. Notably among these political pioneers are our beloved Una Clark yes. and, her and her esteemed daughter, Yvette Clark yes. in New York. Yes. Una served on the New York City Assembly while Congresswoman Yvette Clark represents the 9th Congressional District okay, in New York. Given the foregoing, it is not surprising that the Caribbean community is now a sought-after voting bloc in American politics. This was particularly evident in the 2020 U.S. general election, with a first-generation American, Kamala Harris, daughter of Jamaican economist Professor Donald Harris, appearing on the presidential ticket and going on to be sworn in as the first female vice president of the United States. <laughs> vice president, we've had a secretary of state, and you know, so the presidency must come soon. <laughs> <laughs> Susan Rice, Susan Rice. <laughs> Thank you. Happily, while the Caribbean diaspora succeeded in building a strong community in the U.S., most also maintain a strong connection with their homeland yes. in the Caribbean. As I said before, the neighbor string, the umbilical cord, though geographically cut, is never culturally, psychologically, or spiritually severed. Despite all this, the Caribbean diaspora is too often primarily seen as making a significant contribution to the Caribbean through financial remittances. It is true that even as Jamaica proudly celebrates our 60th year of political independence on the 6th of August of this year, our nation continues to be dependent on the vast import from our diaspora. The importance of remittances to the Caribbean is reflected in the economic data. According to the Jamaica Information Service, the GIS, remittances from the diaspora to Jamaica reportedly reach 3.3 billion US dollars in 2021, <laughs> representing an increase over the 2.9 billion US dollars sent in 2020. And of course, these remittances are a vital source of Jamaica's foreign exchange earnings. And in, this, in addition to the technical balance of payments impact, Caribbean economies are more buoyant because of remittances. And most importantly, many Caribbean families are sustained by remittances. But there is much more to what the diaspora members contribute to the Caribbean than the money that is sent home, as vast as that is. Much more needs to be done to leverage the vast potential that resides in the experience, qualifications, and other capacities of the Caribbean diaspora members in contributing to national development in Jamaica and other Caribbean countries. I therefore want to stress to you this evening, ladies and gentlemen, comrades all, <laughs> that the input of the Caribbean diaspora far exceeds foreign exchange. The Caribbean and my country, Jamaica, also need your skills and your talents to help us to tackle our fundamental developmental challenges. Modalities for your engagement and participation in our national life need to be further developed, and I am committed to assisting in that process, and indeed this tour is a, an initiative designed to make us more effective in trying to make that happen and to facilitate it. We want to vote in the next election. Yes. I want yes. to vote in the next election. Yes. yes. I want to vote in the next election. Yes. 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 Modern technology has greatly enhanced the possibilities for broader and deeper diaspora engagement. Modern technology. So what is needed now is political will yes. and consistency of effort. And as we seek to harness your spirit and capabilities, we must also acknowledge and celebrate all that has made you 
such an indomitable force here in this United States. We recognize the sacrifices that it takes for a person to pack up and leave home, sometimes for the very first time, to leave family, friends, and all that they've known for their entire life, and enter the unknown that is foreign. <laughs> Stepping into a new culture, and for some, a new language. Stepping into a new geography, literally and symbolically. I recognize what it means to navigate complex and challenging systems, government, politics, even transportation. I don't envy anyone who comes from the Caribbean for the first time to New York and has to learn the subway system and do so in winter. So respect you. Respect me and you. But our people have done all this and done it without any fuss. They have just got on with it. I know the Caribbean immigrants often have to sort out their immigration status and settle themselves personally before they can become active in community life. We know that many yearn for their families left behind in the Caribbean and work tirelessly towards reunification with their loved ones. I'm also keenly aware that many millions of undocumented persons in America are Caribbean people and that this separation can lead to the breakdown of families and deep anguish when persons are faced with the reality of being unable to return home to visit a sick loved one or to say goodbye at a funeral. But despite the uphill climb as immigrants to America, Caribbean people have tremendously influenced and indeed altered in positive ways the diversity, complexity, and characteristics of the American body politic. We are proud of the impact you have made and will continue to have on so many aspects of American life. Those of us home in the Caribbean embrace and feel empowered by your accomplishments, despite the struggle of adjustment and integration. When one of you achieves greatness, your entire Caribbean family celebrates with you. Yes. We in the Caribbean continue to experience challenges when it comes to infrastructure, education, healthcare, domestic and transnational crime, the impact of climate change, access to investment for funding, and recovering from the COVID-19 pandemic, among other issues. But we are a resilient people. While Jamaica, at 60, has seen advances in many areas of social and economic life, and enjoys strong democratic governance, irrespective of which political party has formed the government since 1962, the resilient and resourceful spirit of our people remains our number one asset. And members of the diaspora, you are our number one ambassadors. I know that members of the Caribbean diaspora wear your pride for your home countries on your sleeve. No matter where in the diaspora you reside and what spaces you occupy. Vice President Kamala Harris was reported to have said in a national interview before she became Vice President, that she has juicy beef patties in her refrigerator. <laughs> the plethora of Caribbean American organizations that exist in the diaspora are a testament to the commitment that members of the Caribbean diaspora have for their homelands. From alumni associations, to professional associations, to groups of friends who get together to form partner and pool their resources to support their countries, that support is invaluable. Know that the members of the diaspora are part and parcel of the Caribbean community, and we are one family wherever we reside. Jamaica and the other islands of the Caribbean are not limited by geography. As I've said, it's an umbilical cord that connects us all. In closing, I want to acknowledge the milestone of Jamaica's 60th Jubilee and the pride all Jamaicans feel in the country's attainment of 60 years of independence. Of course, as far as nations go, Jamaica is still a youth. There is much work to be done as the country moves ahead. And as we look towards the future, from the, depth, the depths of my heart, I want to thank Jamaicans overseas for your unwavering support of the land of your birth and encourage you to continue to have our backs. I thank the diaspora for all the work you have done over these 60 years in helping the various areas of development in Jamaica. Your efforts are well appreciated 
and the people of Jamaica thank you, even if they don't always show it as much as they should. <laughs> we look forward to the continued engagement of the diaspora and cementing even greater linkages as we move forward. So thank you for coming out tonight. Thank you.